Hi, Annie. Hey, John. How are you? Hey, not too bad. Just trying to get past, past this cold weather. Yeah, I know. I I agree. One day, one day it's cold. One day it's hot. You know, warm. Yeah, the good news is, is le at least for the next ten days, we don't uh, go below thirty, so we don't yeah. see any more of the twenties. So, <laughs> other than for tonight. Uh, good. Oh, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. So. Hey, hey, Rex. Hey, we went out to dinner last night, and I got an automatic car wash. It's nice and clean now. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, those storms yesterday were kind of nasty. Came through. Hi, Susan. Hey, hi, Rex. How you doing? Good. Hi, Dennis. Hey, Susan. Can Dennis. you hear us way out there in the west? <laughs> I, I can. The connection works fine. Hey, great. But it is 75 degrees. Uh, rub it in. God, rub it in, Dennis. Yeah. Thanks. Hi, Rebecca. Hey, Rebecca. I don't know. Can she hear us? Yeah, she just has is muted. Apparently, has, sorry. Hi, guys. She there didn't want to talk to us. <laughs> how'd your How'd your show go? Eh, it was a bust. <laughs> sorry. No, it's, it's okay. It was, it was it's free, a... you know. Like the guy was like, "There's gonna be 15 people there." Well, there were five, including me. So, oh, the first first time they did it. So hopefully the next ones will be better. But there you go. It didn't cost me anything. I made ten bucks. Hey, it's ten bucks more than you went in with, right? Exactly. Met some people. Yeah. Yeah. Got to try. Yep. No, we've done um, wedding shows like that, where all the different desks were set up and uh, just weren't a whole lot of people coming in and circulating. Yeah. And you already spent the money for your own day table, or in our case, we mm -hmm. used to buy two tables because we had extra um, easels with pictures on them and things like that. Yeah. Or they went to everybody else's table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the photographer next to me had an interesting sales pitch. She had a three ring binder, which is photos like eight by 10 slipped into it. And she sold them for like 10 bucks a piece and just handed them with the you know, plastic sleeve. I just was like, what? Yeah, it just that's didn't a... feel right. I'm like, no, that's not like proper presentation. It just, but she had like three or four sales. So. That's a uh, magnet. Yeah. Sometimes they have these magnet. They just magnetize people to yeah, them yeah. And, and it works. Yep. That's all right. But don't compromise. Mm-mm. No, I'm not going that route. Selling my stuff that stay like, with no. underselling. Yeah. Underselling is um, a uh, hit and run kind of thing. Mm -hmm. hit and miss. And if you get a reputation for having a low price, then you're kind of locking yourself in. Yep. Be careful about that too. Yeah. No, I, my prices have been pretty much the same no matter where I go. So. Okay. Good. Good. Hi, Jim. Murphy, I mean. <laughs> hey, Jim, thanks for the uh, heads up on the uh, flare. I changed it. Can't hear you. We can't hear you at all. Mm -mm. And you're not on mute either. Mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> Might need to switch your microphone. Mine did that this morning on Teams. 
and had switched a microphone somehow. I don't know if yeah, you that or not. You're, we can see your mouth moving, Jim, but you're, we can't hear a thing. <laughs> nope. It's like watch, watching a mine. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody put their hands over their ears. Okay. <laughs> he, has no, he has no clue. Well, Jim, we can't we can't hear one thing you're saying. Nothing. The lips are going. <laughs> you can hear us, Jim. Okay. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. gosh, but we can't hear go. you. Next thing you know, he's going to be doing finger, you know, hand waves. There. Well, we will understand. <laughs> he knows you said, there we go. There go. <laughs> ah, you aren't connected for some reason. You're not connected yet. Nope. Still trying, your computer's still trying to connect to the audio, it says. There. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Try hey, one more time. There, 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 you go. Go. There, there you go. Yay! <laughs> no longer are mine. <laughs> so, okay, you want to repeat everything you said? <laughs> what I was going to ask well, is, um, in, maybe it's just uh, myself and Annie, but I did it last month and Annie did it this month. Use the wrong flare. We used the 23 flares for the photo contest. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. Can you? I think I did one for like two years okay. from now. Can I what? <laughs> I can get rid of them. I don't know if that screws up, you know, wanting to be able to go back and look at previous contests easily, but it it will a little bit, but yeah, I can. I mean, either that or just rearrange their location as you scroll down through. If yeah, maybe. Yeah, I didn't even realize it till I saw Jim's uh, message today. All right. I'll take a look at and see if I can move them, move the 24s to the top or not. I'll see. I'll look and see if I can yeah. move them. I think that would take care of the problem because the yeah. 23s is the first thing you get to when you're scrolling down. Yeah, I can. I can take a look at that. And see if I can't make that adjustment. <sighs> What's the matter, Marty? <laughs> I have no picture. I know. I know. I don't know what the heck is going on. That's all right. Jim didn't have any sound, so. <laughs> well, it, I had to update everything. Oh. And it's not like seeing my camera, I don't think. Oh, well, he didn't want to see my ugly face anyways. <laughs> hey, come on. I, I saw your pretty face earlier today. Oh, yeah. It's so pretty. It's so wiped out right now. I know. I'm tired. So, so I don't how did, know. How did... Why is this not working? Damn, it's just too hot. Always display my name on their video. Oh, sorry. I don't mean to read. Read it. But why is it not doing this? All right. I have no idea. My camera's on. You go into the video settings, maybe for the for Zoom. I did. You try turning the whole shooting match off and come back on again. Yeah, just put the video back on. Our default mic and thing. Okay. I had two things like update, so it was like fail to start camera. All right, I'm going to go out and come back in. Good. Okay. Come on. It unt usually untangles everything.
Is Margie on tonight? Uh, no. Okay. My tips and tricks things. I was going to wait till Marty was back on, but just it, it's not crucial. Just the tips and tricks things that I had uh, set up uh, can't happen until after March 23rd. The uh, young lady that I was going to photograph can't uh, come to the setting shoot until after March 23rd, which means that if you wanted to, the next possible date for me to do that would be on the SWIG at the end of the month, which I can do. If, what did I miss? If, in, unless it has to be done on a Monday. No, tip, tips and tricks is on, on SWIG anyhow, I believe, right? Oh, okay. Yes. Well, tips then and I, tricks are on Thursdays. Okay, so just slide mine to March. Okie dokie. There you are. Who's on tips yep. and tricks tonight? Um, I think it was Bob. I think I thought it was actually me. I don't know if you guys can hear me. I'm having app update or app update yeah. issues. Uh, Is that Jim? Me? Yeah. Okay. Yep. And, and Marty, your video is is up and working good now. Well, that's good. I'm glad something is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're good. All right. So Rex is Rex is doing tips and tricks next month. Tips. Yeah, I'll do that on um, that final Thursday. Tricks in March. Okay. Any takers on April? Not that I'm taking over the meeting, but. <laughs> <You're right in. clears throat> okay, people. I know you're all out there. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be like school. I'm gonna start assigning people. <laughs> okay. So as Margie would say, it doesn't have to be long. You can even show a little video clip. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Could be like three minutes to five minutes if you wanted. No big deal. You don't even have to talk. You just show your screen. <laughs> Any takers now? <laughs> you could just show your pictures that you've taken, your photos. I might be able to do June or July. I'm taking a massive trip in May. So if we can just show photos, maybe I'll have them edited by then. So I can do either June or July. Okay. Which would you prefer? Probably <laughs> July. Give me time July. to edit. Okay. Mm. Thank what you. Rebecca. What are you running to this time, Rebecca? Uh, we're doing all the Mighty Five in Utah. Ooh. All five national parks and Antelope Canyon and your Monument Valley and probably other couple of parks there. We've got 13 days. Well, good for you. Can't wait. <laughs> it's an awesome trip, Rebecca. You're going to love it. You been? Yeah. Yeah? yeah? Me too. The five national parks are, they're all spectacular in their own way. Yeah. I've been to Canyonlands and Arches and we went to Monument Valley, but the whole point of the trip is to go to Antelope Canyon and do the slot canyons. Oh. So I've got tours for upper and lower canyons books. So everything else is literally a bonus, but we're doing, it's like, while we're there, we'll do all of those. We'll do Kodachrome Basin and, of course, Monument yep. Valley again and Goblin Park, yep. which is kind of cool. Yep. And, of course, Horseshoe Bend and, like, Powell. <laughs> so. You going to Canyon Deshaies? Mm, I don't think so. 
we got a lot kind of already planned. We're going to go like horseback riding in Bryce. So it's okay. going to be huge. Did Hi, you baby. mention Zion? Mm hmm. OK. Yeah. Because I think that's the most unique of the five national parks. OK. Yeah, it is quite nice. Sounds cool. And you going with all photographers for the trip? Me and my mom. She's my travel buddy. Cool. <laughs> yeah, and I've seen you traveling with your mom before in pictures. Yeah. It's our thing. <laughs> We've been going on trips since 2001. It's good for you. That's always yeah. good. Spend time with your mom. You got no problem good. doing that. <laughs> That's a good thing. All right. Uh, well, I guess we could go ahead and get started then. It don't look like anyone else is jumping on at this point. Um, Jim, do you have some news or do you want to do Jim with uh, tips and tricks first? Well, Jim can do his tips and tricks first, but um, do you want to mention, and I forget the date myself, um, our next photo walk is early March. March 10th. March 10th at Carnegie Museum. And we'll send out an email here sometime next week or so. No, I don't want to mention it. You already did. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> next photo walk, March 10th. Uh, Carnegie Museum. Uh, natural history. Yeah, natural history. Yep. And Jim will be sending out an email about that shortly. Okay, I mentioned it. Okay, thank you. All right. <laughs> Uh, anybody else have anything they want to mention before before the other Jim does his tips or tricks, tips and tricks? Remember to get your photos into me and your title, well, your title, so I can. Oh, or the hey, photos. Ryan, just I'm sorry? one more thing. Um, did you see my suggestion for an after meeting with the officers? Yeah, we can do that. Um, just a quick one to put a, I guess, an idea of when we can get together and do the rest of the uh, planning. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Because it looks like, um, is everybody but Margie on tonight? Uh, looks like it, yeah. I think so. Yep. Okay. Uh, don't forget the titles to Marty for the uh, upcoming show. And that was really, I don't really have anything else I wanted to bring up this evening. So, uh, Jim, if you are ready for your tips and tricks, we are ready for you. Sounds good. I'm going to give it a shot here. I had everything set up on my desktop and Zoom wouldn't update on my desktop. So I tried to run it through the browser, but you can't share the screen through the browser. So we're on my laptop now and I think I brought everything over. So I think we are ready to go. Lovely. <laughs> Do you share desktop and share some? Okay. I just have to give a change my permissions here. Just one second. Okay, let's see. For those that have cookies that they bought from Grace and I haven't delivered them yet, just give me a text and we'll make arrangements to meet up and I'll get you your cookies. Okay, let's see. Are you able to see my screen now? Yes. yes. Okay, the audio will be the next part. So let's try this. So basically what I'm going to do is anybody that's on the fence about maybe trying to photograph the solar eclipse coming up uh, in April, I'm going to try to convince you to go. I went to Tennessee in 2017 for the total solar eclipse and it was really awesome. And I did it without any like fancy filters or anything like that, just a really long lens and got some pretty cool results. Um, and I found this video that kind of gave all these tips that I heard seven years, wow, seven years ago already uh, about 
how to capture it and like things like that. So it's five minutes. And then I was going to go through the filter that I made. I actually made a homemade filter myself because I didn't have enough money to buy a filter. And um, yeah, so um, I'll just go in right here. Does full screen work with video or is, or is there some sort of error with that generally? I can't remember. Would you have anything I would try, try it out? Is okay. if first before you, oh, I was going to say, if you could expand your screen as well. That, that's okay. What, that's good. No, you're good there. Okay. Let's see if it goes. And uh, all right. Register Guard and other okay. USA. Photographers at the Register Guard and other USA Today Network newspapers captured some amazing photos of the 2023 annular eclipse. And we're sharing our advice if you want to photograph the total solar eclipse on April 8th. The most important thing is to protect your eyes. Looking at the sun with your naked eye is dangerous, but looking through a telescope, binoculars, or a camera without proper filters is even worse. As wonderful as this event promises to be, no picture is worth losing your eyesight for. Please be careful. There are a bunch of inexpensive products available that are made especially for solar photography. Properly rated glasses can be purchased for a few dollars, and camera lens mylar filters can be found for as little as 16. And if all you want to do is capture a picture of the total eclipse when the sun is completely covered, you don't need a filter for your eyes or your camera. But you do need a plan. Equipment. You don't need a ton of expensive gear to shoot the eclipse. A digital camera and just about any lens you have should be fine to capture the scene. But if you want to fill the frame with the eclipse, you will want at least a 200 to a 300 millimeter lens. You might want to consider a tripod. Having the camera in a stationary position will allow you to enjoy the experience when not shooting, and it will make it easier to let friends have a look. A remote shutter uh, trigger is a good idea too. You won't have to look through the viewfinder the whole time. Most people aren't going to have a big lens like this. When I went shopping to uh, try to find a filter that would fit over this, I was surprised at how expensive they were. When I actually looked at them, I found out that they really, all they are is a piece of plastic mylar with a uh, surrounding uh, holder. And so I decided to DIY my own. This is a plastic uh, flower pot from Jerry's with some foam core around the outside that I uh, cut and then hot glued to the front of the pot. So it seems to work pretty well. I'm happy with it. For shooting pictures of a partial eclipse, start with your solar filter in place over the front of the lens and set your camera to manual exposure. Auto exposure will likely lead to overexposed images. Assuming clear skies, the sun is a pretty predictable light source. For sun and the phases of the partial eclipse, set your camera ISO to 200, your shutter to 500, and your aperture to 5.6. To be safe, be sure to shoot some tests before the event. You may have to adjust your base exposure for your particular setup. Don't assume that you can look through the camera with your solar glasses on. Whatever you do, put the filter on the front of the lens before you look through your camera. When the sun and the moon reach totality, you will have to work fast. Depending on where you are in the shadow, you will have less than two minutes to get your shots. Increase the ISO of your camera to 400, take off the solar filter, and set your exposure for F8. Shoot a couple of test frames, check your exposure on your LCD, and adjust if necessary. Don't forget that as the sun peeks back out from behind the moon, you will need to put the filter back on your lens and set your camera back to the original settings to capture more images as the sun returns to full view. Don't forget that when the sun peeks back out from behind the moon at the end of totality, you need to get your filter back over your lens and your glasses back over your eyes. Very important not to damage your eyes. A couple of thoughts to wrap up. Based on our tests, I can tell you that pointing a camera directly at the sun will not damage it as long as you use proper filter and shoot still images only. When shooting stills, the mirror and the shutter will cover and protect the sensor when you are not shooting images. I set up a camera with a timer set to shoot images every second for two hours the other day with no damage to the camera. But most camera manufacturers warn against pointing a DSLR or a mirrorless camera directly at the sun using live view. In that mode, the sensor will be exposed to sunlight and heat for as long as you are recording. I have not been able to find anyone who has actually fried their camera, but I don't recommend recording video for more than a few minutes at a time. I was able to shoot a two minute test clip of the sun using a conventional video camcorder 
with the solar filter in place without damaging the camera. Number two, don't waste your time trying to photograph the partial eclipse with your phone camera. The brightness of the sun will overwhelm the sensor during partial phases, and it probably won't be sensitive enough to do a quality job capturing totality. I'll probably end up eating my words on this because people are going to send me great pictures with their iPhone <laughs> later, but uh, you know that, that's my advice. And one final comment. Don't become so obsessed with making photographs that you forget to enjoy this once-in-a-lifetime experience. USA Today Network photographers will be out covering the total eclipse across the country. You can check out the photos throughout the day at usatoday.com. Okay, well that was the video, like a nice intro to it. And uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with the path in, that it's taking in 2024 next month, or I keep saying next month, not next month yet, uh, April. But this is the path. It's going to be on April 8th. And you can see it's kind of going up through Mexico. I'll zoom in a little bit here. It's going to hit little parts of Austin. I think I think it misses San Antonio. It goes through Dallas all, all the way up through and hits Cleveland and Erie and Buffalo. Zoom in. Rochester. So this center line here is where the greatest totality is. So you're going to have more time to to get a picture when this when the moon is fully covering the sun. So um, the next one isn't going to be until, let me see, I had it up here, 2045 in the U.S. So it's going to be really close, less than two hours. And I think people should try to get out if you're on the fence. I will warn, though, that when we went to um, the one in 2017, just outside of Nashville, traffic was absolutely insane. So it was like, um, if you ever sit in traffic after a concert, it was like sitting in a traffic after a concert, driving to the next stadium and waiting for that concert to go out <laughs> and doing that for eight hours. Oh, my gosh. I, I was there as well, Jim. It was a nightmare. Where were you? <laughs> yeah. I found a note on a tooted at you, but. <laughs> were you I, near I, Nashville I, I, I at all? I got to tell you, at the end of the day, my wife and I said, I'm not sure this was worth it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was bad. Like, we we kind of did it, like, spur of the moment. Like, not, not really, like, last minute, but, like, the week before, it was like a, yeah, let's try to go. So we didn't have any hotel, like, anywhere near Nashville. We actually ended up booking a hotel in Cincinnati. And the plan was to go from Cincinnati, drive down to Nashville early the morn in the morning, um, view it, and then drive back. And it was like, okay, that's that's fine. You know, it'll be a long day of driving. But we were not expecting the. I think it's about a five hour drive, roughly, between Nashville and Cincinnati, and it ended up taking us well over eight. Yeah. And if you check the traffic on Google Maps, it was like red everywhere you went. Anytime it redirected you, by the time you got to the next road, it was already red. So, and, and like every gas station that you stopped at was packed. And we finally got to one. I, I couldn't even tell you where it was. I think somewhere near, maybe even in Kentucky. I don't even know at this point. But <laughs> there was a line for the bathroom. This is in the middle of nowhere. And there was, it was like 15, 20 people deep. <laughs> at 11 yeah, o'clock at night or something it was insane yeah the only way to really do that would have been to go to nashville and just check in a hotel and stay for four or five days and then tour nashville the other days because you couldn't get out of the time that, that, that is exactly you it. it you just you're getting in wasn't bad because everybody comes at a different time the traffic was heavy but not unmanageable it wasn't like that that was unbearable right oh my gosh yeah it, it, was, it was it was nuts yeah. I'm thinking about going to Cleveland because it's only so far. And I, know I used to live in Cleveland, so I know my way around a lot of back roads. I'm thinking the traffic's bad. I know how to, you know, take back roads back into Pennsylvania. So I may do that. Yeah. It, it, well, my son's actually flying to Dallas to see it. He's him and a bunch of friends are going down there. Uh -huh. They didn't invite me, so I'm not going. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he wanted anybody over 60 there. So. <laughs> wow. So, Jim, where are you planning on dealing well, due to su a set of circumstances, I'm going to have to be on the other side of Pennsylvania that weekend. 
So my plan is to drive up to Syracuse and I don't know if. Is there any interest in getting some, some people from the group to go over there on that on Monday and to Cleveland? I know people work. So is that something we should be trying to set up as a field trip? I'm down. I'm probably just going to go anyways. I'll figure it out. But on, if we ain't getting uh, moved together, I'd be down. On the television a couple of days ago, they said that up around Erie, there will be the full eclipse show mm -hmm. somewhere up in the Erie area. All of Erie. Anywhere north of this uh, line that you can barely see that my cursor is going back and forth. There's, uh, a state, there's a state park. You see where Mentor is on that map? That's where I used to live. There's a state park. I, the nice uh, Mentor. Like Erie's right Down there. Here. Oh, up there. There it is. I'm on a touch pad and I'm, I was trying to move my yeah. mouse. It's not helping. Yeah, I lived up in this area. So I know this area very well. I, I know Mentor 306. I lived right off of, uh, well, you see Heisley Road on there if it's on there. It's where I lived, but. Yeah, this isn't the greatest map. It's really slow. What what time of day is the eclipse supposed to be? Around three o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. Well, somebody wants to go. I don't know how we can organize this. I'd, I'd go up in the car with somebody or drive up or whatever we want to do and find a place. I don't know if you can look at it. The place is called Headlands Park, Headlands Beach. I don't know if you're allowed to go there to see it or not. We should look into that. Where's the beach? It's it's uh it's close to fairport harbor right there headlands beach right there see it it's right there okay. so I'll zoom out a little bit so you can see it it's in yeah it's, it's there. the nicest beach yeah. on lake Erie. it's beautiful hmm. you probably can go but you won't be alone no i don't think you will no the park i went to in tennessee was a bit larger of a park and they were expecting fifty thousand people there hmm. and they estimate that they got it Gary's right. been promoting this for, I don't know, months already, trying to get people to come up. I don't think they'll have a hard time at all. But while we're sitting here, I'm texting my sister-in-law and brother-in-law. They have a sailboat docked in Erie. So that'd be the perfect place to spend the night and see it if it's not raining. Yeah, that's the risk in Cleveland, though. There's not many sunny days in Cleveland. Yeah. There are a couple sites that give you that break it down into like percentage of like when April eighth has it been cloudy has it been sunny? <laughs> it, it's well, it's wild. There's a lot of information out there. I mean, having lived in Cleveland, it's it's cloudy most of the time, particularly that time of year. So hmm. yes, like here. No, it's worse than here. Trust me. Yeah, this well, is just you know, like the path here, but yeah. And then um, I was going to share a couple of the photos of the filter that I made. Um, if I can, sorry, I'm trying to navigate. How do you, okay, I need to move that. Okay. What kind, now they said that they use mylar. So what, um, is it a tinted mylar that you buy? Yeah, it looks like it. Yeah, it's a, it's a film. It's the same film that they use in the uh, glasses that they make. Well, I have my I have mar mylar in my shop, but I don't have tinted mylar. It's clear, so I know what it is. Where, where, where'd you buy the mylar at, or how did you spend it? I got it from a manufacturer called Thousand Oaks Optics. Um, it's I believe they're based out of California. And I was able to buy a sheet. If you see here, it's probably not any bigger than six by six. So that's all the bigger sheet you bought. Yeah. So what I did was I, I got two pieces of cardboard, and then I put the mylar sheet in the middle, and taped the edges just so it was pretty flat, and made sure there were no holes. Those aren't holes. That's just dust because it's been sitting for seven years in a box. Yeah. And then I put a, um, this is a cup from the Dollar Tree. I put it and cut it and hot glued it um, so it fits around one of my telephoto lenses. And it produced pretty good results. Um, yeah, like there's probably some issues with like the clarity a little bit for like really, really picky people. But let me show you the, the setup first here, if I can figure it out. Why can't I do this? Okay. 
So, well, it, I, it was a really hot day that day. So anybody from the North was in their car with the air conditioner on. So that's just kind of, that's where my camera is back there set up. My wife has an umbrella up. My friend has an umbrella and we had a, uh, blanket over the windshield to keep some of the sun out. It was blistering that day. And this was the, um, the setup here. And that's a 150 to 500 uh, telephoto with a two times extender on it. And so it looks like a huge monstrosity when it's all extended like that. And there's the little homemade filter on the top. And then this is during totality. This is right from the back of the camera, what it looked like. And you can see it's a little bit zoomed in. It's not full frame there. It's just a little zoomed in. And then uh, the results that I got, I'm going to see if I can open. This was the total, um, all the shots I took over the course of like, I think it was about three hours or so. It might even have been a little bit longer. But... Uh, A little bit closer, you can see one of the sunspots. This is one of my clearer frames, but and this is what they call the diamond ring. When the sun's starting to peek back out, you can see a little bit of the, I don't know that there's a technical term for it, but a little bit of the it's flare. Sun flare. The sun. Yeah. 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 flare. Yeah. And then this is totality here. I messed up and I kept my filter on. And so I had to slow my shutter speed decently. I was kind of like, not really, um, I'm not really experienced in shooting like any, like the sun or any solar pictures or anything like that. And so I kept my filter on just cause I didn't want to trash my camera. <clears throat> and I still got a pretty good result of this during totality. Um, but you would get a clearer shot. I, I had to slow it down to like one fiftieth of a second, but it was still pretty clear. And I, I got one more photo, I think somewhere up oh, two more. I think that's the more clear shot. And this is one of the clearer frames that I had. And I was just, you can really see the sunspots in there. That's ah. pretty cool. So, yeah. But yeah, that, that was just kind of like, if you're on the fence about it at all, I would recommend going. And there's a lot of resources even to make your own filter. And even if you don't, B&H still has them in stock. I checked as of about three o'clock today. So you can get filters. They're anywhere between like 150 and like 300 bucks for like the really good ones. Or you can get one similar to what I made, like the like that Mylar one. You can get those for like 30 bucks and they're, <laughs> they look a little bit more professional than <laughs> what I came up with here, but yeah. Uh, Jim. Yeah. Um, I, I won't be doing it, but in case somebody might want to, and they have it or want to get it is uh, I have a variable neutral density filter. Do they work or does it have to be the Mylar? And be because it just threads right on. It's the 72 millimeter. I one of, one of the uh, videos that I was watching trying to pick a decent one, they mentioned that you want if you're using a neutral density, you want it to be at least ten stops, mm -hmm. and they also mentioned that it doesn't block out the infrared, whereas the mylar will block out the infrared and mm -hmm. UV. Mm -hmm. So uh, they they kind of said use a little bit of caution if you're if you're going to use the neutral density, just um, try not to keep your shutter open too too long mm -hmm. if you know how many stops it is if it's at least 10 then it probably would work well it was a good question <laughs> even as a warning to protecting the camera yeah but if it's not blocking the uv and the ir you don't know what's going on with your camera that's to me that's risky i wouldn't well, do it yeah well, I was going to say, uh, I don't want to be the dog chasing its tail, but then you could put the UV filter over the neutral density filTER, but that still only takes care of one end of the spectrum. Yeah, it you doesn't got the take IR care of the IR about. end of it. Then you put the mylar on top of that and you're covered. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
Yeah. So I guess I could stop sharing. That was good, Jim. Thank you. It was great. Jim, Thank you. Was awesome. I, I would go if, if somebody's going. If we're going to take pictures. Someone else can take them. I'll just enjoy the moment. So. <laughs> that was one thing that that I um, tried to do because you only get like depending on where you are, it's between like two minutes and like three minutes and like 40 seconds in totality. And that's the coolest part. Like the difference between 99% coverage and totality is insanely different. And during those like two minutes, or I think it was like three minutes and 40 seconds in Tennessee, but I'm like, I'm trying to get pictures. I'm trying to get pictures like, and, and just enjoy it. I'm trying to like, you know, see my wife. I'm trying to see my friend. I'm trying to look around and experience it. And it goes really fast. But the coolest part was whenever I looked around, it looked like sunset, like 360 degrees around everywhere you could see. It was just kind of like that, like purple, pink and like twilight look. And the other really cool part was whenever it was during the totality, the crickets actually started up. Mm -hmm. And it was really bizarre and like... Right. It, it, it was just the strangest thing. And, and then in addition to that, you just hear a whole bunch of people screaming, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. yeah, about the crickets. Yeah. I forgot about that. B&H &H has one of those, like the, the disposable type um, filters for the front for 20 bucks. So one of the ones that's like cardboard ones that they were showing in your video, they have them for $20. It goes from, let's see here, uh, as far as the fit goes from, look back, uh, 75 millimeter to 100 millimeter for a lens. It's just a cardboard with the mylar, I guess, on the front. And Eclipse Smart Universal Solar Filter for Optics, 75 to 100 millimeter, 1995. And B&H. So I was just curious. Solar glasses are, are 48 cents. <laughs> oh, no, that's for 1,500 pieces. <laughs> <laughs> I dropped the link in the chat these... for uh, some glasses, too. And a video that uh, explains all the things that happen around the eclipse, like just before and just after, things to look for. Yeah, there's, uh, there's a lot of really good videos out there. It, it's it's crazy, like like just just the amount of information that you can find just on uh, like timeanddate.com. Since like I'm a I'm a geographer by trade. I, I really enjoy going through the maps and seeing all the different areas and, and all that. So even, a, even in addition to what DL said, it's like, you could really get lost in the minutia of like the, just the map itself and seeing the speed of the shadow and all that. It's, it's wild. And, um, and then, like I was saying, even though the traffic was like the worst traffic I've ever seen in my life, I would do it again. <laughs> and I don't like traffic at all. So, mm. It's it's definitely worth it, and you don't need anything super fancy to do it either. No, thank thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Interesting. Well, yeah. A lot of interesting information. Cool. Well, glad you guys liked it. Yes. Yeah, thanks, Thank you, Jim. Jim. Appreciate it. Very nice. Very informative. Good one. Thank you. So I've got a short in the news segment that I, before I get started, um, I'm going to tie in Rebecca's story about going to Utah and Jim's story about going to Nashville, Nashville for the eclipse. Um, Pat and I happened to be at Canyonlands National Park when there was a solar eclipse in May of 2012. So, just coincidental that you two brought those different subjects up. Hmm. Was it, I can't remember, was it a total or was it an annular? I can't you remember. You know what's funny? I, I don't remember either. 
to be honest with you. Almost well, um, three, three minutes of your life that you can't remember. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot of three minutes of my life that I remember. So <laughs> we actually had an annular one when I lived in Cleveland. Because at the time, we did a lot of uh, carbon arc testing. We had the filters used on the carbon arc to look through it. So we used those filters and watched it. Yeah. So I remember mm -hmm. we, we just walked out, to, walked out of work and did it and went back to work after we were done. <laughs> Jim, several years ago, there was, uh, I don't know whether it was a total eclipse or partial eclipse in this area. Because I went to St. Vincent and they had um, a telescope uh, that you could see. But you, we also had those special glasses. Do you know what kind of eclipse it was? several years ago around this area? I don't remember, but I can look it up on timeanddate.com. Do you have an idea of roughly around a t uh, decade or something? I can look it up. Yeah, it was, day. I mean, certainly within, well, probably, probably 2019 or something like that. About six, or, about six or seven years ago. Was it six or seven years ago? I, oh, okay. I was at work and we stood outside of work with, uh, okay. welders, with welders' helmets on. In that was probably that was probably the 2017 one that um, that I took pictures of from the in Tennessee. Oh, okay. Yeah. There was cool. like there was like one person that had actual glasses, and the rest of us stood there with uh, welding helmets on in the parking lot and watched it. <laughs> <laughs> Did anybody get a picture of you guys looking at it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure if I asked the guys at work, they probably did. Yeah. It it was very interesting, like you said. I didn't photograph any of it, but it was really cool to watch. And mm -hmm. the the part where at the at the most most cover, I don't think it was total here, but it was really really close to total. Um, but at that part where it was as dark, you know, it was dark and and the whole sunset thing and everything that was very surreal, kind of mm -hmm. to 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 be there. So uh, it's a very interesting uh, process. It's pretty neat. So, Brian, um, I think I'm having the same issues that Jim had initially. Um, when I went to log into the Zoom meeting, um, something was going on. I cannot share my screen, but I'm going to put in the chat box the links. If you wouldn't mind doing the share screening, and then I can kind of walk us through. Sure. So give me a second here. Okay, I just put them in the chat box. Okay, let me open up chat here. Well, you guys have that loading. I looked it up. Um, uh, Brian, where were you working at the time? Are you, I know you live around like Uniontown area. Yeah, it was, I was in um, or Mason Town, but yeah, right here close by. Okay, because I, I looked it up and it looked like the coverage for the eclipse in 2017 was about 82%. Hmm. So now I'll post a link on where I found that at. So everybody, if you want to mess around with that, if you're a map nerd like I am. Well, Jim, if you could do that, that, would you do me a favor in May 2012, Canyonlands National Park? On it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did the one in Cleveland. It was in May of uh, May 10th of, of 1994. So that was, that was an annular eclipse. Hmm. Jim, you're an eclipse tour guide. I'm trying to be. <laughs> I thought I didn't know a lot about it, but it turns out on my research, I do know something about it. Make sure you make the hotel reservations for the next one, okay? Um, I mean, for the group. I mean, if we go, you know, and a bus and everything else. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's... I'm pretty sure I won't be available to make the next one. I apologize. <laughs> But the 2045. <laughs> Don't worry, Jim. We'll wheel you in, buddy. Okay. Yeah. Just <laughs> anyway. There, there's a, at least a couple of others on the call here that might not be there either. Yeah. Let's see, I think I'll be 103. 
<laughs> oh gosh. Let's see. What is that? Twenty forty-five. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to do the math. <laughs> well, I was born in nineteen forty-two. Nineteen forty-two to twenty forty-two is a hundred years. Give me more, and I'll make it. Okay. Somebody wheel me out there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, uh. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if I'll be around either. So, oh. well, just in case, we should make reservation. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put them on your credit card just in case. <laughs> well, I I have lots of reservations. Uh. Uh. Dennis, what about you? Think you'll be hanging around? No. <laughs> Don't drink the Kool Aid. No. Uh, the other option would be the travel. You don't have to live to be 102. You could always travel somewhere that has one. <laughs> Jim, when did you say? You said May of 2012. May of 2012. Where, where at in Utah were you? Uh, Canyonlands National Park. Okay, let me see if I can share this real quick. Okay, so you were, this is, uh, that was an annular. So you were a canyon. Well, I tell you what, we would have, let's see. So you were at 86.72% coverage there. Down okay. here. The most that looks like the most you could have gotten was 87. So the annular eclipse is the one that has, I don't know if you can see that. It's such a small. Yeah. But it's, um. you can see the ring around it. So let's see. It pauses and then it goes. And then that's when you see like that, that gotcha. ring. Yeah. So that's the difference between the annular and the and the total solar eclipse. I don't know if I have that. I, I do recall the you, you kind of described it as like a golden hour or sunset sunrise or whatever. That's what it looked like in the area we were. So even at eighty some percent, you still get that. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And there's totality. That's the difference, I guess, because you get rid of the the ring and it's just completely blocking so you get the that white outline and annular you just get the uh the ring so yeah you were you were pretty close there yeah. i'll stop sharing is this supposed to be like 93 percent here versus eerie at 100 i think that's what i heard i don't know yeah i think it's something like that marty I can so, look. Brian, are you going to be able to share your screen with my links? Yeah, I have them ready whenever you guys are ready. Are you guys ready? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this first one... Um, Companies called um, Glass Imaging, and um, they're supposedly developing some AI-based software that uh, camera phones, well, the, the, the manufacturer of the smartphones would have to implement into their phone design, but it supposedly enables a what they're claiming is a significant increase in image quality for a photograph from a smartphone. And, um, and I think what they'd like to be able to do is to duplicate the image quality of a DSLR, but uh, they're not there yet. But they apparently are capable of improving the, the camera phone image quality significantly. So that might be coming to a phone to you sometime in the near future. So I think that's about it on that. All right. And this next one, I think it just popped up yesterday or today, but the mm -hmm. uh, US Post Office is coming out with some Ansel Adam stamps 
there's going to be 16 different photos that'll be featured and um, it comes out on may the 15th mm -hmm. so that's kind of cool and i think they show maybe a more close-ups brian if you scroll down of which photos are going to be included in the collection that's about as close as they get, I guess. Who's going to go buy the whole sheet? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Buy a couple of them. With, with no intentions of using them to send letters with. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I have some Edgar Allan Poe stamps that I bought just for that, just to have them. <laughs> I bought a sheet of Star Wars stamps years nice. ago. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I used them. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> they look good. I like that. That's a, that's a really cool thing. Mm -hmm. I, I would yeah. buy those. Yeah, I thought that was pretty unique looking. Okay, so the title of this one is International Garden Photography, Photographer of the Year Celebrates Botanical Beauty. And before I started scrolling down, I just assumed it was going to be a whole bunch of flower close-ups. Um, ironically, I'm not sure there's even one close-up among the bunch, um, but there's some really interesting photos here. So, Brian, if you just want to, like, scroll down through them. Well, that first one there, I'm not sure you can really tell on the screen. They look like birds. It looks like birds, and it's the outline of tree limbs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I I was I picked out the birds right away, even yeah, though it's birds. But it, it like I mean, it definitely looks like them for sure. Yeah. Yeah, it's really cool. And that one's like, I think any of us could probably take that photo at a, either sunrise or sunset. I mean, it looks great. Mm -hmm. If it was sunrise, that would be require us to get up early. <laughs> I don't get up as early as I used to. I, I don't think that you can see that um, if it were like a, in a 30 by 40, the blossom of colors that would be in there would show a lot more. Probably it would begin to show the quality of uh, the technique that was used to get the image. The, the color is just uh, in, in the three of them that we're looking at, uh, yeah. they are, especially the middle one there too. Yeah. But I think the color must have something, the variety of greens, the variety of other colors, and some of the subtle colors that are salted in through there, sprinkled in through there, have what to do with the, uh, have something to do with the uh, the quality of the picture, the, what it's intended. This This one here would be an excellent candidate for either a metal print or a metallic paper print. The second one? Yeah. Yeah. This one here. Yep. That one. Yeah, that would look great on metal. Yep. So, Brian, while you've got that photo up there, I got to just interject the short story. Um, those of you who look at Reddit might have noticed that I posted some photos from Savannah, Georgia the other day. Mm -hmm. um, in, real quick story. While we were at Wormslow, which is where that avenue of trees is, where the run forest run scene occurred in Forrest Gump. Um, there were a couple of other photographers there and we just started chit chatting. And for whatever reason, they, they started showing me some of their photos and they, both of them were really good. And they had photos of a place called, which I'd never heard of before, but it's on Jekyll Island in Georgia and it was called Driftwood Beach. So Pat and I actually altered our return trip to head down south before heading north and went down to Driftwood Beach. And um, I was hope well, I, I did go for a sunrise. Unfortunately, the, the sun and the clouds did not cooperate. But this reminded me of 
the, uh, well, the photo that I would have liked to have been able to take, but uh, rather than the woods in the background, it's basically the tree sits in the shallow waters of the ocean. It's pretty cold. And then there's, there's other just skeletons of old dead driftwood trees everywhere. It's a pretty unique location. Hmm. Yeah. This one looks underwater. Yeah. It does. I don't know if it is or not, but it sure does look like it. It looks like seaweed growing up in the on, on the bottom. Oh, that's neat. Huh. That's cool. Are those ice cubes? What is it? That's they look like ice cubes, but it's ice. Some type of crystal. Crystal. Formation. That photo there with the fog at the uh, Lynn Run photo walk last Sunday, we were having discussions about the ability of landscape photos and local competitions to get selected for jury shows. And we were kind of discussing the need for fog to make a landscape photo really kind of stand out. And mm -hmm. this certainly does it. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about it being in the right place at the right time. Yep. Look mm -hmm. at that chipmunk. That was cute. Yeah, I don't know where that one was taken, but I don't want to go there. <laughs> no. mm -mm. Brian, you don't want to meet that, that eight legged figure no. on there. No. Mm -hmm. And then Me he's either. flush and he's got 16 legs now. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> this next one, I, I think the composition is amazing. I don't know if it's the same type of flower or not, but I, whether it is or isn't, it's just really neat to have the, the background flower there. Huh? Man, is that sharp. Hmm. Yep. Oh, it's cute. Jeez. Okie dokie. Here's looking at you. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, Brian, is that frozen or live? <laughs> oh, no. That yeah. one's live. <laughs> you, got, mm -hmm. like, you, got, you got some nice dew on him or... Or or yep. he's spraying with water. Maybe that's the reason he's maybe that's the reason they're looking at. It. He's looking at him that he's spraying <laughs> spraying with water. Hey, what'd you do there, man? You sprayed me. I'm all wet. It's still alive. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's still nice. Pretty cool. I like that guy. He's pretty neat looking. Yeah, yeah. that's pretty neat. All right. So over the last two years, on a number of different occasions, we've talked about the use of AI to create photos and whether they should be used or not used and the whole thing. And um, now AI videos apparently are becoming made possible. And by basically typing in a sentence describing what you want the video to be about, it can be created. Now, the technology is really in its infancy, and I think there's a, a time limit associated with it, like it can create a video of no more than one minute or something. But a couple of these, Brian, are active links, if you want to go down and just kind of show one or two of them. Okie dokie. Play. It's not a plane play. Yeah. 
See if it'll play here. No, won't let me play it. That's interesting. Because that one played for me earlier today. You know what? Oh, there it goes. There we go. Mm -hmm. One of the comments was a lot of the example videos are at slow motion speed. And they were wondering whether that's just a limit of the technology as it currently stands. But I'm pretty sure there's at least one of those videos that does seem to be at full speed. It's down further, the, that, at the bottom of the screen there, that one, mm -hmm. that one there, I think is like full speed. Reason it wouldn't play is because, yeah, that was much faster. Mm -hmm. But the descriptions are, and I forget what, I think it, it tells you, Brian, and I can't see the print from here, but it gives you the, the text that was used to generate the videos. And they're very simple sentences. A street level tour through a futuristic city with which in harmony, which it says, which in harmony with nature hmm. and also simultaneously cyberpunk <laughs> slash high tech. The city should be clean with advanced futuristic trams, beautiful fountains, giant holograms everywhere, and robots all over. Show so more. it's pretty amazing how fast the AI technology is being implemented. Oh, <laughs> one more very, sentence. very fast. One more sentence to that. Have have the video be of a human tour guide from the future showing a group of ex extra, extraterrestrial aliens, uh, the coolest and most glorious city that humans are capable of building. <laughs> so which AI are they using for this? Uh, it's open AI. And the app is called Sora, S-O-R-A. Okay. Oh, this, the, uh, I'm not sure if the dog one's active or not. I saw a couple of links in the uh, chat. You might want to take a look at those sometime. And then there's a silly one with a couple at a beach and a shark comes out. But it's just, they're just interesting demos of the technology, I guess. <laughs> okay all righty then yep hey that's it for me thanks brian yep absolutely there's a bunch of them on there guys mm. wow a bunch of them yeah oh. these are cherry picked but still it's getting interesting the, although it's not active, yeah. that one is the, the top photo with the foxes. I saw that play sometime previously, and it is so realistic looking, it's unbelievable. And as much as I can, although I, I can kind of comprehend how they do it with photos, but to be able to do it with video, just, I mean, it, it just seems impossible. It's 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 kind of interesting um, with the AI. We talk about AI with photos and AI now with video and stuff like that. But recently um, at work, we downloaded and and switched browsers on a lot of the stuff that we're working with now to let me see what the name of it is Microsoft Edge. And the reason we've done that is that. Microsoft recently came out with, and I don't know if you watched the Super Bowl, but they they had it on the commercials there called Microsoft Copilot, which is added in the Microsoft Edge. And it is an AI thing. And we started using it now at work to write our Facebook pace or posts. Um to write, I'm using it now to write descriptions of cars for the uh used cars. 
in that. And it's amazingly well done. Um, and we've actually, since we've started that, we've seen a increase in um, clicks, an increase in, my phone's talking to me. Um, <laughs> we've seen an increase in, in actual clicks on the ads and in interactions between the ads and uh, the stuff that we've been posting. So it was interesting. Um, but I just go in there for like a description of a car and I go, I'll, I put in the sentence, write me a description of a 2018 Silverado 1500 LT in what color? And it does the rest and it pulls information from the web is where it's pulling it from. But it pulls out like what engines were available and their horsepowers and torques and um, what kind of options were available. And it adds that all into a, a, a nice paragraph or two or three, however long I decide to make it. And uh, it's 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 pretty interesting how how well it does just that. Um, so it's useful for that. I'm definitely, you know, I've definitely started using it and it's been useful for doing that. Um, and it writes really well-written statements. So anyhow, what's this app called, Brian? Um, if you use Microsoft edge as a web browser, it's built into that, or you can go to uh, Microsoft Copilot and you can test it on their website. If you have Windows 10 or Windows 11, just click on the Edge icon. It'll open up on the side. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Jim, there's other websites, uh, including uh, free versions of what they call Chat GPT well, as well. Well, using that, yes. Using that. And then also Gemini. Uh, Gemini uh, has uh, uh, the Google search engine. And uh, you could get the free version, which is Gemini Pro. And of course, there's an advanced version called Gemini Advanced, and that's Ultra Gemini. But yeah, there's some free versions, and I've used it to write a few little sentences, and it really does do a dramatic, uh, how can I say, litany of words that really is impressive and all. So uh, uh, I'm not going to cheat on any test, of course, because, you know, but kids may be using this to uh, use it on test and all that, which hopefully the... Mm -hmm. The teachers will pick they up. Are. <laughs> oh, I'm yeah. sure they are. Because one of the things that this copilot does is if you can, if you allow it to look at the web page that you have open next to it, and you can go in and tell it to give me a summary of what's on that page. Wow. And it writes you a summary. Right. You can, and it, it'll take all the information off that web page and summarize it in wording, normal wording, you know, not. Um, and I've done that as well, just fooling around with it, you know, playing with it. Uh, and then you can tell it to be technical or you can tell it to be whimsical or funny. And it will take that information and, and do what you tell it to do with it. And it does a really good mm -hmm. job. It's actually quite, quite interesting, but it's something to play around with. I mean, we talk about AI and how, you know, we, we, we may or may not, depending on your view, like it as far as photography goes. But this is a, a case where AI is helpful. Mm. Um, you know, you know, well, I'm Brian, using it's, I mean, it's it's taken quite a bit of time away from my job. It, it's made it easier, made my job easier and quicker for me to to write these descriptions of cars and stuff. And they're way better descriptions than I could write. You know, way better worded, way better, way way more information, all that kind of stuff. So. Just a thought, something I something I ran into recently. We just started doing it about uh, about a week and a half ago, and like I said, we've seen an increase in in customers clicking on the ads now. But the one guy that I'm working with, he uses it to write his emails to his customers too. Yeah, they could do that. Yeah. Uh, in the past, we've talked about uh, AI generated photography, and with Google, they're able to put a small a marker in the uh, print so that they could tell whether it's AI generated or normal photography. So uh, I'm pretty sure these other vendors will do the same thing because uh, some of these AI generated images are just almost like real photography. And um, like, I think there was an example that uh, someone won a contest and they had to rescind that because it was AI generated. Um, but they're getting smart. They're putting these small little more, at least Google is for AI is putting a small little uh, 
cop not a copyright, but just a small imprint to tell anyone else that you can't see it on the on the on the print, of course, but you could tell by whatever software they have that it is gener G AI generated. So Yep. All right. Any questions or comments or anything so far? Oh. All right. So I believe that was it last last week meeting we did the live edit thing, right? Yeah. And Jim and Beth both got to do theirs and we ran out of time and I didn't get to mine. So I'm going to start with that and then segue into using mask for Lightroom because that's what tonight's talk was about anyhow. So I think I can combine the two and show you guys how I do that. That works for y'all? Yeah, yep. that'll be fine. All mm -hmm. right. Let me share the right screen. Okay, y'all see uh, pictures from Phipps? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Yep. But there's that that is as far as I got with my pictures from Phipps, and I just got that done today. Uh or actually while while we were talking, it was downloading the picture. So um I'll do my live edit kind of right from here, uh, as far as where I start when I'm looking at pictures and how I go about that. And I'm not going to go through every picture there as far as there's 162 pictures here, but hmm. I've shown you guys this before. Uh, this is how I would go through, pick pictures that I want to look at and then make a decision as to whether, as to how I want to, uh, which ones I want to work on. And these are unedited. These are 100% unedited. I just downloaded them to Lightroom while we were on the meeting this evening. So I haven't touched any one of these. I haven't even looked at them. Um, so I don't even know what I'm looking at yet. Hey, Brian. Yes. Uh, is there a, a way you can take up the full screen? And I only have about a 13 inch monitor, uh, you know, laptop here. And well, it's, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, just just hang on because uh, what you're oh, seeing now is the whole group of pictures, right? Well, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So hang on. Here, here we go. Oh, so okay. here's how here's how I look at my pictures. Is that better? Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what I do with my pictures when I when I download them into into Lightroom, I start right here. I start with the first picture. I put my finger on the letter P, and I put my fingers on the arrows, and I go through the pictures very quickly. And it may not go quite as quickly tonight because you know because we're on Zoom and everything. But I will go through the pictures. In each picture that I like, I put the I just touch the letter P. Pick it. So what I'm doing is is called picking, and you'll see when I click on one. That was one of the fairies. Mm -hmm. uh, on something that I like, you'll see it say flag is picked, and that's all I'm doing. And I can go through all my pictures. I go back and forth with my arrows. If there's a couple of the same flower or same whatever. I go, well, that, that, no, nah, that one. All so right. You don't, like, you don't mark them for deletion. You don't do, X, you don't X them out. The ones you I don't do not do. delete them. I do not reject them. I don't do anything but pick them. Hmm. Um, I never delete any of my pictures. So every picture I take, I have. Um, with the exception of, you know, if there was one that was just completely <laughs> junk, you know, and there was, there was no way I need, you know, I might, uh, um delete that one but for the most part i keep every photograph that i take whether i like it or not i actually have a better one of that from my iphone i believe uh but anyhow you kind of get an idea of what i do and this is how i do it i just look very quickly at what i did and what i pick there's there's the infamous picture mm -hmm. I hate every one of these. Um, <laughs> we got to throw at least one in there to look at, though. I took a bunch. Or, I, I don't. I, yeah, we got to pick that one. I did already. Um, uh -huh. you know, I won't. Like I said, I'm not going to go through all 162 of them, but that gives you an idea how I do that. So once I've done that, I'll go back to my full grid, and then I go under filters. And I click the one that says picked this white one right here down at the bottom. 
And that has now taken that whole 162 pictures and it's dropped them down to the ones that I look at. And then I go back through a second time and I look at them a little bit more closely. And at this point, if I'm going to work on it, it becomes a five-star photo. I don't go one, two, three, four, or anything like that. So I put my finger on the number five at this point and I go, well, do I want to work on it or not? Does it make sense? That one does. That one, not so much. I like that one. And I would go through and do the same thing. That one. That one, that one we need. Okay. So now that I've done that, I go back and then I click my stars down here. And now I would have my pictures all, all the way narrowed down to the ones that I'm interested in working on. And that's how I would go through 500 photographs in minutes. Uh, I make decisions very quickly. Uh, and then every once in a while, I'll go back and, and relook at them as far as my picks and all that stuff and just see if there's anything I missed as I was going through them. But usually, if you're going through them and you don't like it immediately, it's not worth looking at is how I look at it. If it was something that I liked immediately, I hit my letter P and move on because then I'll come back to it and go, does it does it make sense for me to work on it? Um, so for that, that would be how I get to the pictures that I'm going to edit. Um, now over here, I have collections of stuff. All these collections that I have, these are finished photographs. I don't put anything in a collection until it's done. So when I have this done, if I like it, then it will go somewhere over here in a collection uh, and be added there. That way I can find it later on. Um, but let's take a look at this picture here, because I think this will work best for masking as well, for the kind of masking that I do. So once I've picked a picture, then I'm going to go to the develop module and start working on it, making decisions as to what I want to do with it. Um, one of the things that I do first is I go into lens correction and I do the two buttons, turn them on. Uh, it automatically picked my lens, which that was shot with the Sigma 35 millimeter. So it made that adjustment. It does the uh, adjustment for the chromatic aberration and I close that and I'm done with that. Then I'll go back to basic and believe it or not, I click auto to see what it looks like. I want to see what, what, uh, what Lightroom thinks I should do. And then I decide, do I like what, uh, do I like what Lightroom did or do I think Lightroom's an idiot uh, for my photograph? And in this photograph, I think Lightroom did an okay job. Um, we can always just click back and look, but I think Lightroom did a good job of bringing in the top, bringing in my stuff up top and making that a little bit better. The colors aren't too bad. They might be a little bit oversaturated, which we can adjust that. And then I just kind of start adding or I start going from there as far as how I'm going to, how I want to edit this photograph. What do I want out of it? Well, the first thing I want is I want the roof to be not quite as bright, um, but we're going to get to that in a second. That'll be when I start adding some, some masking and stuff in here. Uh, overall, I tipped the exposure down a little bit automatically. It bumped the contrast up a little bit. Uh, I think that's okay. Uh, I'm going to take the saturation and just drop it down just a hair for the screen that I'm working on, what it looks like. And I not very much, minus four. My vibrance, it took up to a plus 15. I think that's too much. I think these, these pink flowers down here in the bottom are too bright for me. They're a little bit too much. So I'm just going to back off that, bad, that uh, uh, vibrance just a hair from what Lightroom did, that ain't too bad. And I don't work in any particular order. I just kind of look at things and I like contrast in my pictures. So I'll probably add a little bit more than that. I'll bring my highlights down just a hair more. And whites, I'm gonna hold the option key down and click on the white just to see where my white points are. So if you look up in the right hand corner, so up in this area here, you'll see some blue when I do that. That's the blown out area. So go more or less. I can bring that down. I'm going to bring that down to where there's just a little less of that up there. And I'm going to hold the option key down and do with black the same thing. You'll see like that. If I go down here, a little less of that. 
And I think that's a little bit better than what it was. Um, when I'm working on something, the next thing I'm going to do is add a snapshot at this point. So I go over here to my snapshots. I hit plus, And I'm just going to say this uh, basic color and create a snapshot. So I have one there. It's basic color. That's my very first basic adjustments that I made. All right. So the next thing is, is this roof to me is too bright. So I want to, I want to lower the roof, but I don't want to change anything in the room. So I don't want to just do exposure or highlights. I need to work up in this area. So that's where our masking starts to come in. So I'm going to go up here and I'm going to use a uh, linear gradient on this one. So I click that. I'm going to come up top with my cursor. You can see it there. And I'm going to drop in a linear gradient about like that. Now these are nice because you can adjust them left and right, or I should say up and down. Uh, you can adjust this and what it's what's going to be worked on is the, is the stuff that's in red is where you're looking at you can make it stronger by making it tighter uh but i like to use them where they have some a nice little bit of uh fade to them as they're coming down so i don't like to get them real real tight unless i need to uh this one's a little bit crooked so in there that's probably where i'm going to use my mask at uh so now when i come back over here everything that's in my tools is now working just in that mask area, which is really what I wanted to do. Uh, so first off, I'm just going to try dropping the exposure a little bit. And I can say right now, I don't like that at all. It looks horrible. So double click that. Let's try dropping the highlights a little bit. That's a little better, a little better. And let me increase shadows just a hair. And check my white point. You got to be careful with whites, as we as we all know that uh, they turn gray fast if they're close to close to being blown out. Mm, that ain't too bad. Okay. So that was, that's how I would use that particular uh, mask, a linear gradient. Um, you can go in and, and subtract stuff from this now because I can come up here to my mask and turn it on and off. So there's before, there's after. I can click in here. You can rename it. You can invert it and do make it work on the other side or the other end of what you worked at. You can duplicate it and invert it. Uh, you can uh, duplicate the mask completely. Uh, you can delete it, those kind of things. Um, but I'm happy with the way it is right now. So what I want to do now is create a new mask. And my next thing that I'm going to do, uh, you can brush stuff in. You can do object selection. We've talked about all that. Uh, but for this picture, I want to do something a little bit different. I'm going to do a radial gradient. I love radial gradients. And we're going to put one in the center and I know you guys are going to say what but hang with me Let's bump this in here and I'm going to click on this and invert it so I want to work on the outside edges of that so I want the center to be left alone and I want this outer here to go down I'm going to bring the exposure down Bring those highlights down a little bit and maybe put a little shadow in it. Questions so far? Concerns? Everybody still there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Make sure I wasn't talking to myself. Okay. Okay. Well, um, it'll be the first time you did that. No, I talk to myself a lot. But of course, when you want expert advice, that's the way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right so i kind of like that i think that's a little bit cooler uh but i think i want to do let's do another mask and let's do a mm, let's do another radial gradient let's put this one up here 
I'm going to turn this guy this way. That be a little wider. And I'm going to take this one and just warm it up just a hair. And bring you exposure. Brian, I couldn't hear you. What were you changing on this one? Uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm talking to myself again. Uh, mm -hmm. so, um, I went into this, this one here. And what I'm doing is I'm just, I warmed it up a little bit. So I ran my temperature up to 30 and I'm actually going to increase my exposure just a hair, not very much, just a wee little bit. Um, and I'm going to do this twice because I'm going to do this on the other side as well. And I don't know if this is going to work or not, but it's just a, it's, it's something that uh, I want to try. And if it don't work, we go back in, delete it, and start over again. It's no big deal. So I'm going to do another one over here. And if you grab these guys, you can stretch them and then turn them so you can point. And a lot of times how I, you know, remember the picture where I lit the light bulbs up in, in Carrie's, Carrie Furnace? Yeah. This is how I did it. By using these radial gradients and elongating them or stretching them whichever way I wanted them turning them the way I wanted them, and then using temperatures. So I'm going to add the temperature to that. I'm going to duplicate what the other one I said was a 30. So I want to do about the same with this one. And I'm going to bump the exposure just a little bit. And here a contrast and highlights. OK. If I take all my mask off, that's my original picture. That's the new one. I don't know if it's any better or not. Uh, I'm actually kind of, I'm actually kind of not liking the roof now. The center part of the roof is not the same color as the outside edges. So I might just do another radial gradient in there because we know what our number was. Brian, would you do an on and off on the the two radial gradients that you did at coming in from the side corners? Sure. Sure. Give me one second. Let me add this one in. And this one, all it's going to get is a little bit of temperature to bring it up to what the other ones were, which was 30. Okay. So if I take this one, turn it off, turn it back on, the other side off, on, and then my middle one off, on. So I was able to warm those up, but not change the temperature down here at the bottom. I'm kind of liking that a little bit better. But this one needs stretched out a little bit. And this one, I think, needs to go up that way just a hair. That looks a little bit better. All right, so let me shut this off and just kind of look at my overall picture. I hit the letter F. It takes away all my tools, and I can look at my whole picture and decide, do I like what I did or did I really screw it up? I don't think it's too bad. Um, the tilting uh, right and left columns don't bother, bother you. The what was that again, Dennis? I'm sorry. The, the tilting, whatever they are, on the right and the left, um, aren't, aren't vertical. Used upright. Not quite. I mean, they do a little bit, but it's a it's shot with a 35, so you're going to get a little bit no matter what. Yeah. I will straighten this a little bit when I get to the end. Like I don't okay. straighten or crop anything until I'm done with what I'm going to work on. Okay. Once I'm once I'm satisfied with the overall of everything that I did to it, then I will crop it. Um, let me hit the letter F, and we can go back at this point. So yeah, if you look, this is crooked across here, like straight across. So I'm going to straighten that. And that should help these a little bit. Um, but they're going to have a little bit of that just because of it being a wide angle lens. Um, well, Brian, I'm with Dennis on this one. I, do you ever use, I'm not sure what Lightroom calls it. I, in Capture One, it's called the transform tool. I know you have yes. something similar. Yeah. Yes. That's it. Yeah, we have transform. That's and right. you can use upright. Yeah. I think what's going to happen is when he does, if he does this as part of his demonstration, He's going to lose the bottom of the image, and that the uh, that first set of flowers are going to be smacked down to the bottom or even cut off. Yeah, I'm I'm afraid of that with this. 
this room i've i mean it's a nice room but it is hard to shoot the whole room and get everything because yeah, for sure. these guys i mean your fences you know i'm standing i was leaning against the uh I should, yeah, this one I was leaning against the the wishing well. So your fence is what, maybe two feet, three feet in front of you at that point. So, and then from there to the flowers isn't very far, but let's try well, shooting it. Yeah, in Lightroom, you can choose both or either. You can choose just the verticals or just the horizontals or both. Okay. Um, I'm going to just try straighten it across first. So I just go into crop, grab my angle tool, and I'm going to put it there and drive it across there. And it straightened that a little bit. So I'm happy with that now. That's straight across. Side to side is good. But mm. again, like you said, you we have we have our issues here and here. Mm. Um, now, I know that other people in this group are way better at making that adjustment than I am. But I will give it a try for you because I usually don't do this. I normally would leave this alone. So if I go in here and go to what, vertical? You'll see that moved it back crooked. Or no, there it did it. It mm -hmm. did it on its own. Uh -huh. yeah. That's pretty good. Okay. That's, yeah. Well, and in and in this particular case, I think I could I could live with that because it did crop a little bit off the front but not enough that it's bothering me too much. What do you guys think? Let's I think that looks great. Yeah, I think it looks good. That's not too bad. No, it cropped it off the top a little bit too, which helped not lose the bottom. Yeah. Uh, it also started to uh, bow in the verticals. They've now got a slight curved in. So... You can go up the, to the where you had um, your lens correction. There's also a manual slider in there that you can use to uh, unbow those. So the distorted. Uh... Yeah, the the mm -hmm. the um, transform tool can take care of that too. But um, I find that using the uh, manual correction tool all yeah. right i see what you mean yeah i will have to play with that a little bit as far as how that works it looks like you know depending on all the other things that have been done to it that one might have more reach than the other depending on uh what's already been done to it it looks good it looks good yeah all right, so that would be, at this point, I would do just another snapshot on this. And I typically would call this probably finished, not cropped. Just so I have that in there now. It's That's a finished product that I didn't crop. I mean, we cropped it a little bit, but that was just fixing it. That wasn't actual cropping it of any, of any kind. And then the next thing I would do uh, in is I go back to back into my into my basic here and I'm going to click on this little group here and I'm going to go look at this thing in black and white just because Dennis is here and he understands that we need to look <laughs> at black and white no matter yeah, what absolutely. always <laughs> um and I like to just I like to just for black and whites I like to go down through their presets um and just put my mouse over it and see what it looks like with whatever their little preset is and see if it makes any sense and then if it doesn't, we can, you know, I would, I would, uh, if I think it's a nice black and white, I can jump over to, to Nick and go from there it would be uh, an option for me. Um, I'm not caring for that one. I kind of like that number three. Usually three, five, and six are the ones that uh, work out the best for what I like. Brian, I agree with you. This could be a really nice black and white because there's so many lines and whatnot in there. It just it has a good look to it in black and white because you don't you don't rely on the colors necessarily on this shot to, to make it. Yeah. So I like that. That's number three, black and white three. And like I said, normally I use three, five, and six. Uh, I'm pretty. They're typically 
get me where I want to be as far as if I'm using the Lightroom version. Now, obviously, the better way of doing this is to go to Nick and use uh, the Nick Silver Effects Pro. Way better options and way better uh, usefulness of it. But you can amp up or down the black and white uh, amount right here. I don't know if you see my cursor there. Uh, typically, I kind of leave that at 100% where Lightroom put it. Um, and then I'll close that. And then I can come back in here and then, and again, go back in and make some adjustments to my photograph based on black and white at this point. So photograph based on black and white, I think I'd like to see a little bit more contrast and maybe bring the highlights up just a hair, not very much. I like contrasts and blacks. I'm going to bring them down and get a little bit more black to it. Actually, I'm going to hold my option button down and take a look at it that way. I like using the Nick Silver effects because it gives you the zone system. Um, no. And you can like literally look to see where you're at and see if you have all the zones or not. Um, that ain't too bad. Margie would be nice. fairly disappointed in me to take a nice color picture like that and turn it into <laughs> black and white. But what do you think, Dennis? You're my black and white guy. Uh, I think it might be a little contrasty. A little too much? Yeah, you need to let it set for a day. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we'll back that off. I went from 41 to 30. We'll leave it sit there. Yeah. And I'll take you know, this again. Similar to uh, when you're in basic and you take your first shot at it with uh, auto, you can also take your first shot at it with right next to auto is black and white. Also, the nice part about that is then you can go down and uh, manipulate the colors for each of the uh, uh, corresponding black and white component. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, we can go in to the black and white, like in, in work in here, too. So, and actually in this, I probably might want to come into my greens and maybe lighten them up just a hair. Remember, all this was green. So, all, all your round, the flowers was green. These flowers down, I was pointing with my finger on the screen, that won't work. Uh, these flowers down in here were what magenta color, pinkish color. Mm -hmm. So we can go into uh, purple maybe and dark. No, nope. See, that's not actually adjusting those. Let's try the magenta. Oh, sometimes it will not okay. respond at all. Sometimes it'll respond massively. Sometimes not at all, depending on. Oh, how uh, close? Yeah, how close to the actual color it is. Yeah. But magenta, magenta definitely made those flowers change. So we can make them white if we Whoa. want to be. <laughs> um, but I think actually just lightening those up maybe a hair, kind of like that. It's too bad. Uh, and if you take the one, any one of those sliders that are colored and move it fast, one whole direction to the other, you can kind of get an idea of what's in there that's the color. And then you can make adjustments to that color if you can't remember what it was when it was in color. Uh, that might be a little bit better. I think it's still got a little bit too much contrast in it at this point. Let me back that off a little bit. Yeah, that's not too bad. So again, I would come over and do another snapshot. And I'm going to call this in. Guess what? Black and white so the reason i do the snapshots is i can always go back easily so there's my original color uh, or finished not cropped there's the one that was basic color and then we went in and made the changes and all that stuff or i can go back to the black and white one so i have those three snapshots where i can bounce back and forth anytime i want in that picture to look at what i've done in the past all right, guys, so that would be how I would do a live edit. I mean, that's pretty much it. That's how I would do it. Um, 
almost every picture I like to at least look at it in black and white. I may I may not make an actual black and white snapshot, but I typically at least look at it in black and white to make a decision if it needs to be, if it should be a black and white picture or not. In this case, I think black and white works better than the color version did. Um, I think that's cool. Um, and that's how I use mask. I don't get real into the whole, um, like, I'll, there's intersecting mask and you can go in and delete parts mm. of your mask and stuff like that. I don't normally do a lot of that because I use the radial mask the most, or the most, I should say. Um, and the, the radial mask, I think, works the best because I can add it in and I'll do... Some pictures, there might be 10 or 12 or 14 radial masks in the picture where I've used that to work in second in little sections here and there. Um, the linear mask that I use first to do the, to do the top, I use that all the time for, for skies. Um, and if I don't use that, then I do I use the, uh, the Adobe uh, Sky Select, which is really well. It does a pretty good job of doing that. So when you go in there to start a mask, uh, you can tell it to, and we've talked about this before, you can tell it to select the subject, select the sky, mm. select the background, and it's pretty good at doing that. Um, and you might have to adjust a little bit from there, but it's pretty good. But as far as these masks go, the radial gradient is my absolute favorite. I use it for, I, I would say that I use it in every photograph pretty close. 99% of my photos has at least one radio gradient in it, if not more. Um, all right, questions? Yeah, when you do a snapshot, Brian, that's something I've never done before. When you do that, does that give you like it in, back in your uh, in the loop view? Do you see three different pictures then? Is that what happens? Yeah, if you go over, if you see them over here, but basically a snapshot is, is it it takes all the information that you've done so far and adds that into the snapshot. So when we did the basic color, if I click on that, it's all the information still in the history over here, but it's added oh, it's over there. Okay, I see it. Yeah. Okay. So it's all in the snapshot over here. Okay. Um, and I could go back there if I wanted to and work again from there and do another one. And then when I get to that point, I can do a snapshot at the end of that okay. one. And then I can do a snapshot at the end, or I can go back to the black and white and mm -hmm. say, I want to do this, but I want to tint it. So I can do a whole nother black and white version of this and then do a snapshot with it tinted. And then I still have black and white and I still have tinted. So I get to keep both of those without making virtual copies and having a whole bunch of stacks of photos or anything like that. They're all in a snapshot for me. That's pretty cool. Uh, how, do you, how do you do that? Just just a snapshot? Is it the, there's something you click on? Yeah, it's you just click. in there and right next, oh, plus, right next plus, to the word snapshot plus. is a plus okay. and minus. Okay. Okay. Cool. So you just hit the plus and and it'll it gives you the option to put the snapshot on. I always name it for what it is that way, you know, because otherwise yeah, you don't yeah. have to buy a time and that don't do me any good. Um, but I like the snapshots, especially if I'm not sure what direction I want a photograph to go. Um, I usually keep double copies in the loop view. This that's much better. That, that yeah. extra tip. Yeah, I don't I don't like stacks of photos because I get confused as to whether it's a stack or not a stack. Or I usually stack when I do like a like a photo, you know, a, a focus stack or something like that. That's yeah. when I stack pictures, so I know all the pictures I use to build into that one. But that's the only time I do it. Okay. Yeah, I, I will stack, sometimes a, an HDR photo, I'll stack them in Photoshop right. so they're together. Yeah, exactly. It's about exactly. the only thing I stack. Right. Same, um, same thing. Focus, focus, stack, same idea. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I, the, question, I, love the, I like the snapshots because it, it gives me everything there. And like I said, if I can, and like Dennis said, well, I'll come back and look at this tomorrow or, or a day or two from now. And I might go, you know what, that'll look probably pretty good if I put a little selenium tint to it or something like that. So I'll do another I'll do another adjust, adjustment to it and then name that one Selenium and see what I like then. Then I can I can always go back to the black and white without having to dig down through my history to get to that. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's the way. That's the reason I do it. I like it. Um, so I highly recommend the snapshots, especially like I said, if it's a picture and you're 100 percent sure it's going to be a color picture and. Uh, it's going to be, you know, once you're done with it, it looks good and you're done and you're never going to change it again, then go with it, leave it alone. But if you're not sure, the snapshots are a nice way to, to just add your versions in there. 
so that you can keep moving along and kind of decide which direction you want that photograph to go. Yeah, that's good. I have another question for you, Brian. A, a, sure. a, few, a few years ago, you showed a picture from Phipps where you took a flower and you put it in black and white and you, you blacked out the background and all that. You did it in Photoshop. What okay. Was, with the new masking tools in Lightroom, would you do that today in Lightroom? Just, just curious. Sure. I mean, it, it would work. Okay. Sure. Oh, it crashed photo. It crashed Lightroom when I did that. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first time I've had Lightroom crash in a long time. <laughs> The library. I gotta go go back and find that picture now. Open. Uh, you, you know, there. Um, I don't know if it'll work, but down at the bottom where the uh, film strip is, <laughs> uh, there's a left right arrow down there. Oh, you already. Okay, you got it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sometimes if you get. Uh, out of uh, if you forget where you're at and you want to go back to something, you just hit the left arrow and it takes you back to a previous. Uh, yeah, I, I couldn't do that because I wasn't um, I wasn't in the right year of photos. That was oh. 23 photos that were up there. Hmm. OK. All right. Let's see if this crashes or not. Uh, subject. OK, so it did a pretty good job with that. Um, I want to I'm going to do that. I want to subtract some of this from there, and I'm going to subtract using a brush. So let me make a big brush, and I'm just going to get rid of this part over here that it picked. Brian, I. What what did you select to get that initial selection? Was it a subject or? Uh, yeah, I just did. I told Adobe or I told Lightroom to go ahead and pick the, um, to select the subject. Okay. So it took a look at that and said, okay, this looks like the subject to me. And it didn't do too bad. So we can, for this example, we can use it like this. So now at this point, this is my subject that's selected. Um, so what I would do with this is I'm going to tell it, uh, I'm going to go back in here. And I'm going to tell it to invert the mask. So now it left my flowers alone and it's everything else is, is cover is in mask at this point. Right. Right. Okay. It's all in a black background now. I just dropped it. Just dropped the exposure. Out. Yeah. Okay. It's quick. That's quick and easy. Now I can see like in here, there's a little bit of highlights in here. So uh, I'm going to take uh, my highlights at zero and I'm going to take my blacks and blacken them. And now it's, there's nothing in there. This is all gone. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's a quick, easy version of doing that. Um, I would rather photograph it so that that is a little bit darker in the background just to start with, if that's what I'm going to do with the picture. Uh, but if you mask it, invert the mask, and then delete all the information, basically, uh, it'll give you that black background pretty quick and easy. Thank and, then, you. and then from there, I would uh, do another mask. I'll do a radial mask because we like radial mask. <laughs> and I'll get in here and turn this guy a little bit and bring him down and i want to work in there and bring my exposure up a little bit and add a little, little bit of contrast to it highlights a little bit shadows i'll put a little bit of shadow into that is there a reason you didn't copy and invert the mask uh copy and invert which mask well the so the the mask oh. that you ended up creating for the background it's an option 
copy it's that a, and then invert it, you should end up with your flowers. Yeah, you could do that, but um, I kind of didn't want to. I didn't. I don't like when I do my mask. I don't like sharp edges on my mask. So if I copy and invert that, then <laughs> all this stuff along here is all a sharp edge between the black oh, and the white. Okay, I got you. So by me not inverting it and not not making a copy and in, an inverted copy, um, I can come in here with a radial and kind of work on it. I'm not really going to affect my black in a background because it's it's pretty well pure black at this point. But I can work on my flowers with a radial mask and just kind of work on them a little bit and. I don't know. It's just kind of the way I would do it. Um, once in a while, I do the inverted mask, but most of the time, I would just go straight into a radial mask like that um, and do that. Okay. And actually, I would probably do another one here, and I'm going to do a little one right in here. And I'm going to take that section warming up just a little bit, a little bit of warmth and just a hair of exposure. Just kind of give him a little bit more uh, pop to him. Mm -hmm. So when you do those, the, the inner circle takes the full effect of your change, right? And then the the outer circle shows where it kind of feathers into, right? That's the that idea. is true. Yes. So the closer to the center, the more, uh, the stronger the change will be. So if I wanted that to be smoother on the outside, I can take my centers. Oop, I grabbed the wrong one. But if I grab this, I can make that center. So then it'll fade more going out. But the, the inner circle is still the full effect, 100%. inner circle is still the full effect, yeah. Okay. The, 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 the inner circle is the, the most of the effect. And then it goes out to the other one. It becomes less and less of the effect. It fades out. So, of course, you can adjust that by grabbing this bottom little, no, I forget which one. Oh, you have to, you have to do it by the inner one. So I can tighten my inner one up and get more fade here between right. the inner and the outer. Uh, or I can fade it less by going this way. Um, but that gives you, that's your fade between there and there. Cool. I'm going to work with those. You, can, you kind of get this. I've never used it. I use the radio filters very rarely. Uh, I'm going to try them more. I think you make some strong arguments as to why they're valuable versus doing the, the hard masking, which is what I've always been doing. Well, I, the reason I like them is because I can just like that. I didn't kind of, I didn't really want that. I didn't like that straight up and down. So I can adjust these guys to put light the way I want it. Yeah. It, it, it's helpful too, because when you do the masking, sometimes the masking is frustrating if you only want to do part of the flower. Getting that mask just right isn't trivial. Yeah. Yep. So in this one, I probably would even add one more quick one down here. And I'm going to add a little one. And if you lay these really close flat, you can make a flat, almost a flat line on something if you want to. Uh, which is how I like the how I lit the floor underneath the uh uh the light in uh yeah. At Carry Furnace. Now this one I'm going to warm up just a little bit. Not too much. I don't want too much too much to him because he's not quite in focus, but just a hair more, just to pop him a little bit. And then you can name these masks. I think I mentioned that I would go if I'm doing something where I'm going to have like 15 masks. I'll go through and name each one. So that if I want to come back to it quick and easy, I can get back to it to make an adjustment. That one needs to be just a hair brighter. But anyhow, something like that. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? No, that was great, Brian. Thank you very much. Uh, thank okay. you, Brian. That's good. Very good. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let me stop my share. Okay, and you make it look way too easy. <laughs> <laughs> I would have sat there for four hours trying to figure it out. <laughs> um, and I would be, I mean, like on that on that particular flower, I probably would be a little bit more precise on my black background, um, just because 
I, you know, I'm looking at it here and I can see a few little spots that need a little bit of adjustment to that edge, to the edges, but we were just, just trying to do it quick and easy. Um, but yeah, as far as making a black background, it's that simple and easy, but if your background's really bright and has a lot of stuff going on in it, it's going to be harder to get it to go away. Like we just did. There wasn't right. a lot in that background, so it wasn't too bad as far as pulling it away. Um, so you got to be careful of that. Um, I like to, if I know I'm going to do that, I have some flowers towards the end of that group of pictures that we were looking at originally that I shot with the idea of them being black backgrounds. So they're exposed differently. Um, and I always, as, as Marty knows and Annie knows, I always have my, uh, uh, flashlight with me so we can we can add the light to the flower and black the background out a lot easier with the camera so that when I get back here it makes it a lot easier to do that but anyhow hey I'm Brian thinking. you can use the tone curve to either make something either completely black or completely white or somewhere in between oh sure yeah yep yeah definitely there's, I mean, there's a hundred different ways to do it, but uh, that was a quick and easy way to do it right there. All right. All right, guys. I uh, appreciate everyone hanging out for the evening. And Officers stick, officers stick around? Officers hang out just for a few minutes. And uh, everyone else, have a good evening. Thank you all for stopping. Goodbye. Okay. See you in 2045. Uh, <laughs> 2045. Bye. Before, before the main team leaves, I have a question. Uh, on the uh, Greensburg Arts Center, uh, I'm not sure where to find the prospectus. Is there prospectus floating around out there somewhere or um, on a lake? On a lake? You know what? I have to have Beth. Yeah, I don't think yeah. Beth has sent it out yet, Rex. Okay. Okay, so I'm not remiss yet. <laughs> right. Watch it. Nope. We'll let you know when. <laughs> All right. I'll get her on it. Okay. Thank you, Bye, everybody. Thanks. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye, guys. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Okay. I think we have the officers. Um, let me stop recording.